From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and God rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Well, welcome to worship at Fort Street Presbyterian Church. It is so good to be with you here today. Uh, I just want to take a minute to say I, I got to do my first wedding at Fort Street yesterday, and I want to give a big thank you to Loretta Stanton and her whole team that helped make these weddings happen. Um, we were actually doing a wedding for a couple that was you know, scrambling to find a place to do their wedding that had lost, you know, most of their um, guest list because of COVID and uh, were just trying to get married and to, uh, to celebrate. And so it was good to be a part of that. It was good to see uh, Loretta and her team in action. And um, it was so much fun to be a part of our first wedding here at Fort Street. And so it was good. It was good. Thank you for joining us for worship, whether you're online or the two or three of you that are here in the sanctuary. It is so good to be with you here today. Will you please join me in our prayer of confession? Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. 
Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the dead-end values. The profit and pleasures we prioritize damage people and your creation. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. And now, God, in this time of silence, hear the confessions of our hearts. Friends, while it is true that we have sinned, it's a greater truth that we have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is our imagination. Now, kids, you all have an incredible imagination. And adults, you had a great imagination, but some of you have kind of lost it. It takes practice to keep your imagination. So we're all going to practice imagining right now. Imagining is so powerful because you can picture in your mind something that could be. You could picture something in your mind, even if it has never been before, even if you have never seen it with your own eyes. You can make up stories and live out scenes that maybe are even impossible in real life. So today we're going to use our imaginations to picture something that maybe you have seen in real life. Pastor Garrett and I are starting our first garden together. And we've had some help from some wonderful people in our congregation like Doris and people that know a lot about planting things and growing things. But Garrett and I are still really new at it and we need to picture what it is that we are growing before we get there so that we know what to do. So let's use our imagination. You can close your eyes if you'd like. You can just stare straight ahead, and I want you to think in your mind about different kinds of plants. Imagine a carrot growing. Imagine what that might look like underneath the earth. A carrot doesn't grow on top of a tree or a bush, but it grows under the ground, doesn't it? It's a root. Imagine what that might look like in the dirt as the seed breaks and the carrot goes deeper and deeper and deeper and turns more and more orange. What a beautiful thing. Now let's imagine a flower. I want you to imagine a daffodil. And instead of growing down, a daffodil grows up. And at first, it looks almost like a piece of asparagus. It's green, and it's thin, and it's closed. And I want you to imagine in your mind what it looks like as it opens. The bright yellow catches the sunshine And the petals open and smile. 
Last one, I want you to imagine how a bunch of grapes grow. Grapes don't grow in the ground like a carrot and not even just out of the ground like a daffodil, but they grow off of these great thick vines and these tangly sort of branches. I want you to picture what it might look like and think about what it might feel like as you imagine the grapes starting off so small and growing bigger and bigger and more round. We're going to use our imagination in a moment as we read the scripture about a vine and a branch of a grape plant. And so I'm going to ask you, however old you are, to use that imagination and to picture those grapes growing as we hear what Jesus says about them. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for the gift of imagination. Thank you that you allow us to see pictures in our mind and to think about what things might really be like even when they're not in front of us. God, make our imagination alive as we come to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Amy. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Listen for God's word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for what you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this image of the vine and the branches. Lord, open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to the message you have for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. You know, the cultivation of grapevines is one of the oldest and most universal experiences of humankind. In fact, not too long ago, there was evidence found for intentional grapevine cultivation dating back some 8,000 years. Can you believe it? 8,000 years? My mind can't even grasp how long ago that was. There were shards of pottery that were found in modern-day Georgia that have pictures, images of clusters of grapes on them and of people dancing, and historians know that this type of pottery was used for a kind of wine. Even scripture speaks of vineyards in its early, early pages. After the great flood, it says that Noah planted a vineyard. Grape vines, growers, and branches run deep in the story of human history. So it's no wonder that Jesus uses this relatable and universal image to help his followers understand the kingdom of God. In this passage, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what they will need to know and to do as they go on after he has left them in a physical body. I love John's gospel because it is unique and because it is poetic. Unlike the other gospels, it isn't so much story narrative, but it's poetry and wondering and our imagination really comes into play. Throughout the gospel of John, the writer helps people understand who Jesus is by using seven I am statements of Christ. Jesus says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. And each of these I am statements help those followers of Jesus and help us to understand a little more closely who this person is and was and what we might have to do with it. I am the true vine. You are the branches. Garrett and I have some friends in Montana who started their own vineyard and winery. 
And I know what you're thinking, a vineyard in Montana, doesn't that seem like it wouldn't work very well? But actually, this vineyard is fantastic and a great success. They use grapes that are really hardy and can handle those cold, cold temperatures of the northern plains. And they grow all kinds of other fruit, too, that they use for their wines. It's called Tongue River Winery, and I encourage you to look them up. They are not sponsoring my sermon today, but they are wonderful people, and we believe in their mission and what they are about in fact, Bob, who is, um, runs the vineyard with his wife, was a pastor for 30 years and went on, as he says, to delve into another kind of spirit for people's benefit. But Garrett and I got to spend a lot of time at this vineyard and at the winery that is attached, and we got to see it in all seasons. In Montana, seasons are pretty dramatic and drastic. And so even though I don't know much about the process of growing grapes or of making wine, I got to see little glimpses of it. And I picture that as I read this text and images come to my mind of what Jesus is really talking about. I want us to go back and dwell in our imagination for a moment as we think about what the vine and the branch has to do with who we are and who Christ calls us to be. So I want you to picture once again, not just one single vine and branch, but picture a vineyard in your mind. You can close your eyes if, you, if it helps. You can picture one if you've seen one in your past, or if you haven't, just imagine what it might look like. Notice rows and rows and rows of vines and branches. Think about what it might smell like. Imagine touching one of the vines, the bark under your fingers, the leaves, and the grapes. Imagine the taste if you pull one of the grapes off and eat it. Picture one of those single vines and single branches. And as we think of ourselves in this light and wonder what it means for life today, let's consider what Jesus says. You are a branch. To be a branch within the kingdom of God means that we have to start with humility. If you picture that vineyard scene in the winter, you'll notice that it's a little different than how you likely first imagined it. It'd be bleak and perhaps a little hopeless looking. After the harvest and when the frost sets in, vines and branches can look like twiggy nubs. It doesn't seem like any sort of life could ever come out of them. Some might even call it ugly. Both vine and branches in certain seasons look dead. And if we think about it, more of the year is spent without fruit than with it. The grape harvest is fairly short in the grand scheme of things. It takes patience to grow grapes. Several years before the first fruits actually appear. And then even when growth begins to happen, the life of a tended grape branch is full of redirection and correction. Without any intervention, these plants can be incredibly wild and will grow in all directions and go helter-skelter. They need tending and guidance, something to follow, and they need to be redirected and cut back and pruned in order for the fruit to multiply. Being a branch is not glamorous. It's humbling. 
And if we're honest, most of us would admit that we would prefer to be something a little more substantial, at least the vine, if not the vine grower. We'd like to be the one in charge. But to be a follower of Christ, we must start with humility. And remember that even if our lives aren't glamorous or front-page newsworthy, we are with Christ. In humility, we open ourselves up for redirection and even for loss. Picture your branch on the vine in a vineyard in winter. Recognize that you aren't the one in charge. You aren't the source of life. But you have the gift of being connected to it. The first time I took a tour of that vineyard in Montana, it was in the winter season. And as I walked past these rows of vines and branches, I thought, there really isn't much to look at here. The vine growers were excited to show me what was coming, and I realized after a while that they could see something that I couldn't. Where all I saw were nubs and death and barrenness, they saw the life that was still working beneath the frost. They saw the hope that was to come. To be a branch in the kingdom of God means you are humble. It also means that you are not alone. Picture now your branch on your vine in your vineyard in the peak of growing season, perhaps right before the harvest. And what does it look like? There are leaves and grapes everywhere, leaves fluttering in the wind, grapes so big and juicy that you can almost taste them. It's a beautiful mess of tangling, intersecting branches. And the branches themselves are hard to distinguish from one another. Where does one begin and another end? For better and for worse, life as a follower of Christ is communal. Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber talked about the challenge of this kind of close living. She said, if I'm going to bear fruit, I want it attributed to me and my branch. If I'm too tangled up with other vines and branches, I might not get the credit. We can relate with this, can't we? If we remember that we are branches that are intertwined, we recognize that our health depends on the health of those we are surrounded by. As branches, we're called to celebrate the fruits of our neighbors, to share the sunlight with them. We're also called to share their burdens. For adult education, we have been reading through Bonhoeffer's life together. And one of my favorite quotes speaks to this so well. Bonhoeffer says, The Christian must bear the burden of their sibling in faith. They must suffer and endure the sibling, and it's only when they are a burden that another person is really a sibling and not merely an object to be manipulated. He goes on to say that Christ demonstrated this by taking on the burden of so many people. And Christ carried the weight of that burden as a mother carries her child, as a shepherd enfolds the lost lamb that has been found, and I would add as a vine carries the weight of its branches. That weight was so heavy that it led Christ to the cross but it shows us the way. Go back to that image of the vine and the branch. Notice how those other branches run together and need one another. To be a member of God's family means we are part 
of each other. To be a branch in the kingdom of God means we must stay rooted to the vine. A real branch does not have the power on its own to get up and move a walk away, but we, however, can ignore the source of our being. Just before the harvest time, when you see that vineyard in its full glory, it's hard to even see the vines. The branches are so loaded with fruit and with leaves and flowers that the vine is hidden underneath. And the same can be true in our own lives. Many of us remember to pray to God when we are in distress or we are having anxiety or grief. But when we feel fruit and when we see joy, we forget that there is a sustainer sustainer underneath it all. The vine and the branch hold together, and we also need to recognize the one who holds us up. To be a branch in the kingdom of God means we have reason to hope. Did you catch the promise in this scripture? Abide in me as I abide in you. Christ already dwells in us through the word, through God's Holy Spirit animating our bones, we grow from this solid vine and are set up to bear fruit. We already have everything we need to do this. It's a gift to be connected to that true vine, to have that source of life supporting us and holding us even in seasons of cold and barrenness. We remind ourselves of that source of hope every time we share the feast of communion with one another. We take it in and we allow God to be in us so holy that we are connected. When we remain rooted and remember the one who abides in us, we bear fruit. Fruit that scripture reminds us looks a lot like love and joy and peace and patience, and kindness, and generosity, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Fort Street family, you are branches. Let us be humble. Let us lift up the others in our midst, share their burdens, remain rooted, and know that Christ already abides in us. Let's pray. Holy God, we picture the vine and the branch. Thank you for the image that you give us to help us know you more fully. Allow us to be people that lift one another up, and shoulder their burdens so that we can produce great fruit that points back to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Before we enter a time of prayer, I just want to say I know that there are a lot of technical difficulties happening. I can tell uh, just by the activity happening in our sanctuary. 
my phone's been blowing up during this whole time. And I just want to say that it's okay. It's okay that things don't run smoothly. It's okay that things are delayed. It's okay that there are distractions. We're saying goodbye to Amy today, and this is going to be part of it. I think the most important thing during these times are our presence, our attention, and not getting too flustered with things not going the way they should. With that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of Easter hope, no matter where we are, where we're going, or what we're doing, We know that we find our help in you. God, even when technology fails us and we get into a tizzy, we know that you are there. You're the creator and sustainer of all that has been made and will be made. And yet, the immensity of creation doesn't distract you from caring personally for every person in it. We know that is true of your care for us, too. You don't daydream or become weary in that care. We thank you that you not only watch over us with diligence, but that you will guide us so that we will not fall. Whether we are awake or asleep, you are there. We know that you watch over all our living. You have in the past, and we know you are now. Your promise holds for the future and for eternity, and we praise and thank you for that. This morning, we bring before you the people and situations on our hearts. And now we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Amy and Aspen up, if Aspen is in the mood. (laughs) As Pastor Garrett mentioned, today is Amy's last Sunday with us, and we wanted to take a moment to pray over her and to wish her well as she leaves. Amy has been such a huge gift to our ministry and to the life of Fort Street Um, She began just before Garrett and I did in September, and one of the first things that I noticed was that Amy was going above and beyond to help make the worship experience more accessible for everyone. Whether they were watching at home, whether they were tuning in later, whether they had difficulty with hearing or with eyesight, she was conscious of how to make other people, everyone, experience worship well. And we are so grateful for all that you have brought us And Amy leaves because she is headed to an internship in music therapy in Chicago. And so she has this obviously incredible gift you heard her sing earlier. And I know from personal experience, because she has brought our five-month-old daughter to the piano and has let her be introduced to music in a wonderful way. She has an incredible gift and will be a huge blessing. And we know that as she goes from here, what she does is ministry even if it's not in the walls of a church. 
And so we wanted to let you know how thankful we are for you, not just as pastors, but as a whole congregation. The deacons have put together a beautiful little gift for you. Also for Aspen, you are fur mama. There's some treats in there for Aspen. And um, an image of Fort Street for you to remember us by. Thank you. You are so welcome. And Amy's mom is here with us today. We'd like to invite you up as we say a prayer over Amy. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your servant, Amy, and for Aspen. God, thank you for the life that she has brought to this faith family and to the lives that she is going to give so much benefit to through her gifts and her skills as a music therapist. God, we pray that you will pave the way for her and for Michael as they move and as they transition and experience new things. God, surround them with Christian love and hope. Bless her path and remind her that what she does is ministry in service of the Lord. Thank you for her and her testimony to you. Be with her and help us all to seek your presence as we go. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Just a couple of announcements to share with you today. First, immediately following the postlude of today's service, we will have our annual congregational meeting. 
and we hope that you will participate in that, hear a little bit about where we have been and where we are going. We will be meeting over Zoom, and you can find the link in our newsletter or in the comments of our Facebook Live, and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, because of the annual meeting, we will not have coffee hour today, so stick around for the meeting to see one another's faces. You're still allowed to have coffee, if you would like, to the meeting. That's more than welcome. And join us for that. Also know that we have um, adult education continuing on Bonhoeffer's Life Together series, Sunday mornings on Zoom, starting at 9.30. Even if you haven't read the book, you are welcome to join the conversation, so tune in for those. And also mark your calendars for our last documentary discussion on uh, Thursday, May 15th. We will be talking about the PBS special, Black Church, and you are invited to watch that ahead of time and then to bring your thoughts and your questions to our Zoom call on that Thursday night for conversation. And I bring it up again because this is a long series. It's two segments that are two hours long each. So you have a couple of weeks. You can start now and watch it in shorter segments, but it's an incredible piece that will help us think through vital congregations as a Matthew 25 church. So join us for that. Now, as we prepare to leave our time of worship, know that you are a branch. You are an insignificant branch that is deeply loved, that is connected with others, and that is rooted in the love of Christ. Go now in his name, and may our light so shine and our joy be so obvious that all who see us may come to praise God. Amen. Amen.